Well, welcome everyone. I'm Sandy Knapp and I'm the current president of the Linnaean Society and I'd like to welcome you all to this year's science policy lecture, which is done every year in conjunction between the Linnaean Society and the Systematics Association. So thank you very much also to our Systematics Association colleagues for participating in this joint event every year. We're very lucky tonight to have as our speaker Dieter Helm, who's a professor of economic policy at the University of Oxford and a fellow in economics at New College. Dieter is the independent chair of the Natural Capital Committee, and he's written a number of books, the most recent of which are Green and Prosperous Land from 2019, Burnout, the Endgame for Fossil Fuels in 2017, The Carbon Crunch in 2015, and Natural Capital, Valuing the Planet in 2016, all of which have been published by Yale University Press. That's an amazing number of books in a very <laughs> short period of time. I'm dead impressed. His new book, Net Zero, will be published in May 2020 by William Collins. Dieter's provided extensive advice to both UK and European governments, including the Cost of Energy Review for the UK government in October 2017, and for the European Commission in preparing the Energy Roadmap for 2030. He served both as a special advisor to the European Commissioner for Energy and as chairman of the Ad Hoc Advisory Group on the Energy Roadmap. He's also assisted the Polish government during their presidency of the European Union Council. He's a director of Aurora Energy Research, a leading energy modeling company, and chairman of National Natural Capital Research, developing natural capital models and assessments for the better use of land. And his natural history credentials are also quite good because he's an honorary vice president of the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. So welcome, Dieter, and we're looking very much forward to what you have to say. What I wanted to say to people is there's been a set of slides sent around, and Dieter's just gonna talk to us without the slides, so if you want to watch the slides while he's speaking, please do go ahead, but he won't be showing those slides. And when it comes to questions, please put those questions into the chat and keep yourselves on mute during both the questions and during the lecture. So thank you very much and over to you, Dieter. We're looking forward to it. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about natural capital. Um, the, the exam question in a way is not so much you know, what's going wrong as what is it that we have to do to uh, protect and enhance our natural environment? And what in particular do we have to do to make sure that we enable the next generation to inherit uh, an environment, a set of natural capital assets, which are at least as good as the ones uh, we inherited uh, and um, that these are passed on down the generations. Now, these questions are urgent, uh, desperately important. Uh, I think uh, there can be few who don't realize what's happening to our climate, what's happening to our biodiversity, and what's happening to uh, all the assets that lie behind that. We have to turn this tide around. And what I'm gonna describe uh, this evening is what we'd have to do if we were actually serious about uh, protecting and enhancing that natural environment and about our duty to future generations. And I'm going to argue it's practical, doable, we have a set of tools to work through uh, to help us uh, get to that end and we have now lots of practical uh, areas where these tools can be applied and we can do so much better. And, and I want to contextualize this in a, in a particular way. You know, there are those of people who say, well, you know, the environment's very nice, but it's a luxury good and, you know, we can't afford it right now. Uh, there's all sorts of other pressing uh, problems and, um, you know, we'll, we'll deal with the environment later when we're rich enough to do so. Always put it off till tomorrow. Well, you know, if you have an efficient economy, all the costs are included. And a sustainable economy is an efficient economy. And, you know, when people talk about sustainability, and a sustainable economy. What they fail to often follow it up with is that if it isn't sustainable, you know, if our policies aren't sustainable, then the economy won't be sustained. And therefore, we won't have the opportunities to uh, do the stuff that's the everyday uh, uh, substance of economic activities. So it's not some kind of extra a sustainable economy is the only economy that can be sustained. And that's what I'm gonna describe this evening. Now I'm gonna go about this in a series of building blocks. 
I want to start with the conceptual framework. Now, a lot of people uh, might say, oh, well, you know, we know all about the concepts and, and, and that's all theoretical and academic. No, if you don't get the concepts right, if you don't ask the right questions, you have no chance of getting the right answers. And I'm going to point out a number of ways in which we've been framing the problem incorrectly. And it's not surprising that as a result, we haven't made a great deal of progress yet. We can, we should, uh, it's perfectly possible, but you need the right conceptual framework to do that. So I'm gonna start off with that. Then I'm gonna look at how you embed natural capital in the economy. Again, not as the economy versus the environment, but the environment at the absolute core of the economy and any economic policy and any economic functions. And that is where the toolbox comes in, the natural capital toolbox. And that's going to be about baselines, about thresholds, about capital maintenance, about enhancements, about balance sheets, stuff that environmentalists don't normally talk about, but is of the essence of making sure that uh, the environment is central to the economy. And then I'm going to talk about a few applications. And these are going to be uh, topical. I'm going to talk about the polluter pays and the pricing of carbon and carbon taxes. I'm going to talk about uh, public goods for public money and new agricultural policies and uh, how to think about elms uh, and uh, some of the new ideas coming out of uh, DEFRA and through the Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill. Then I'm going to talk about net environmental gain. and That's going to be about uh, building development and how we make sure that when we do damage the environment, we make sure that we really compensate over and above for that damage properly embedded in a natural environment. So that's my agenda and I'll end up uh, with uh, the prize that we could have if we did this properly. So as I say, let me start at the beginning and let me start with uh, the concepts. So natural capital has gone from being a kind of esoteric concept to becoming absolutely mainstream. Everybody now talks about natural capital in a way they really didn't when uh, I took over as the first chair of the Natural Capital Committee back in 2012. It's gone from the periphery to the everyday language. And with this comes serious risks because we've been here before. When uh, we had the Brunton report, people were all talking about sustainability and sustainable development. And we all know what happened. It ended up in greenwash. Everybody interpreted whatever they did as, quote, sustainable or sustainable development. And the result was that uh, everyone could claim to be doing the right things, but actually uh, it was largely meaningless. When large oil companies described themselves as sustainable in the 1990s, you know something's gone wrong. Um, and natural capital isn't like that, or it shouldn't be. It's a hard concept. It, it has a right interpretation and a wrong interpretation. It is measurable in large part, and it's accountable too, and, incorporate, and it can be incorporated in national and business accounts and so on. So what distinguishes natural capital from sustainability and all these things? Well, the answer is profound and it's about assets. The word capital is about an asset like other assets we're familiar with, except this is the most important. Um, and when we say assets, in, in an important way, the way you define something is by saying what it isn't. So it isn't flows. It isn't ecosystem services and all the stuff that goes into uh, the conventional cost benefit analysis framework that economists use. These assets come in systems, not marginal units. They're not discrete little lumps. And that, that'll turn out to be extremely important when we think about housing developments and net, net benefit. And the reason why assets matter is it's assets that give you the capacity to function, to live the good life, to have opportunities. And when we talk about intergenerational duties, it's the duty to pass on those natural capitals, 
that environment that nature gives us for free to the next generation so they can choose how they want to live their lives. It's not about utility and making people happy and making sure future people are happy. This is about enabling people to have the capacity to choose how they live their lives in the context of a decent natural environment to be set. Now, of course, assets cause flows. They result in uh, uh, environmental services, etc. But it's a huge mistake to start with the ecosystem services and work back to the assets, which is what conventional economics does. It is that there's a break in that connection and we want to start with assets. And every economic activity, and economics is about the allocation of scarce resources, is about the allocation of that natural capital and man-made capital and human capital and social capital and cultural capital. It's about the application and combination of those things to produce the outputs that uh, form the basis of our consumption. So assets, hard assets, measurable assets are the cornerstone of thinking about a natural capital approach uh, to our environment. Now, there are different kinds of natural capital, uh, just as there are different kinds of man-made capital and human capital and so on. But the most important distinction is between renewable natural capital by that, that's not about wind farms. This is a, a, a concept that was there long before people attached to particular kinds of energy. So renewable natural capital and non-renewable natural capital. Now, modern capitalist economies and socialist economies are built on the consumption of non-renewable natural capital. Oil, gas, fossil fuels are what turned uh, the uh, relatively primitive economies before the uh, 19th century into the modern economies we have today. It's non-renewable natural capital that enabled the world to get from 2 billion people in 1990 to 7.5 billion today. Now that stuff, the oil and the gas uh, and the coal, is effectively given to us from nature for free. It's our endowment or rather it was the endowment of people in the past. Forget for a moment, although it's of course deadly serious, all the pollution that goes with this. Um, and what previous generations have done, and the current generation, is use this stuff up. And if you use a non-renewable up, it isn't available for the next generation to use. Put in its simple terms, my generation uh, used up the North Sea oil and gas, we had a party from it in the sense that we had higher public expenditure and lower taxes. We spent uh, nearly all of it, nothing left for future generations. And now it's not there for those future generations. Now, it'll turn out that they don't need it because we'll hopefully not be using fossil fuels. But I hope you get the gist. If you have non-renewables, someone can use it, but if they use it, someone else can't, and particularly future generations can't. So it's beholden upon us to compensate future generations for our consumption of what they won't have. So if you think about North Sea oil, uh, the Norwegians set up a sovereign wealth fund. They set aside some of the benefits uh, at the time to them of their oil and gas, and that's now available as a sovereign wealth fund for generations to come in Norway. We did none of that. We just simply consumed it. Now, there's a lot to be said about non-renewables, but that's not what we're really talking about uh, in this lecture. What really matters are renewables. That's the stuff that nature gives us for free and keeps on giving us for free forever, provided we don't abuse nature. So I'll give you a really simple example, um, but it, um, it, it really captures the concept. So if you think about the herrings swimming around the North Sea, well, actually around the top of Scotland and um, down through the Irish Sea that formed the basis of a, a pretty staple industry for Britain for quite a long time. Now, we can harvest those, provided we don't harvest too many so that those herrings can't breed, reproduce, and be there tomorrow, next year, uh, in 10 years time, in 100 years time, in 1,000 years time, indeed until evolution catches up with them. 
So the value of one of these renewable natural resources is not just what we can get from it today, it's the value of that in perpetuity. And that is a huge value compared with a non-renewable natural capital, physical man-made capital and so on. So these things are really valuable forever. And that's why we should cherish them. And for renewable natural capital, nature will go on doing its thing, provided we do not drive these uh, natural capitals below the threshold by which they can't renew themselves. And indeed, we need to put a safe limit in place. And in the Natural Capital Committee, we described what those conditions might be. So natural capital is a hard concept. It's about assets, not flows. Flows come from the assets, but it's an asset-based concept. It's core to what we should leave to the next generation and generations to come. And it's the renewable bits that really count. And we have the opportunity to make sure that they're with us forever, provided we don't screw them up too much. And that leads us to how to encapsulate our duty to the next generation. If we wish, and it is the government's policy, and it was in the white paper in 211, the natural choice set out, if we do want to honour our stewardship of this planet and make sure the next generations get uh, a good environment, a better environment indeed than the one we have since we've done so much damage, then there are a couple of rules we could apply. We could make sure that the renewable natural capital is always there and compensate future generations generally for um, using up the non-renewables, that's what the Norwegians do. Or we could say we have to make sure the renewables is okay for the next generation and we have to use the revenues, some of the revenues from, use, from depleting the non-renewables to enhance renewables into the future. And those rules are different and I won't uh, labour them now, but um, um, I think it's very important to get that ethical uh, obligation well set. Now, that's about the concepts, natural capital, assets, renewables, thresholds, safe limits, uh, sustainable rules into the future for uh, meeting our obligations. So what about how we would um, embed these ideas? Theories are good fun, interesting, they appeal to us academics, but um, how do we make sure that they're embedded? Well, here um, we now have, and it's very recent, a fantastic cornucopia of tools that we can use. You know, if you go back five, 10 years and you said, so how well are we doing with our renewable natural capital? Well, you could pot around the countryside, you could have a look at some uh, ordnance survey maps, you could um, uh, inspect woodlands, you could have a look at the state of the rivers, you could take some samples. You know, we weren't in ignorance when we were damaging these things. We did it knowingly. But what we can now do is look using satellite data, drones, uh, all sorts of data sets. We can look at any area anywhere in the world and assess what natural capital there is on every so, so many square meters. We can see what we have never in the past been able to see. And we can see a lot of that remotely. And so what we can do is create a baseline. We can know what we've got in detail so that we can lift the veil of ignorance about our natural environment. And we can know about all the natural capitals, not just some of them. This is extraordinary. And um, in the Natural Capital Committee, and very much led by my great colleague, Cathy Willis, um, we propose that we should do the equivalent of a doomsday book for the United Kingdom, or at least for England, which is what we cover in the Natural Capital Committee. Um, and we should do a baseline census. We should look at the entire country. We should have a map of the natural capitals. And we should then be able to uh, have that as a basis to work out how to do the next two things. The first thing is that we have to make sure it doesn't get worse. And this is where the first accounting concept comes in. 
Okay, natural capital assets are there in perpetuity. They're forever. You don't depreciate them. You maintain them. So in accounting terms, we have to apply capital maintenance to make sure that there isn't a deterioration. And that's a first claim on the revenue, the spending. And I'll explain what that means for accounting and particularly national, natural, uh, uh, national accounts in a moment. Okay. So we look at that baseline. We have the digital technologies to analyze in great detail what we couldn't analyze in the past. And then we say, okay, this is the maintenance required. We can see if it's deteriorating. And um, you know, when you look at what's been going on since we started as the Natural Capital Committee in 2012, things haven't been getting any better. But what we now know is we can, we can, or we could see if we did the baseline properly, exactly what is in fact happening. And we could report very clearly whether or not the overall objective, which the government set itself back in 2011 of leaving the natural environment a better state, is actually being met. And um, uh, our hope is that the new Office for Environmental Protection will be able to do precisely that, empirically, scientifically, accurately, and indisputably, so no one can wriggle out of um, uh, uh, pretending that things are getting better when they're not. So that's the first thing. But now there's now's the opportunity to go forward. Okay. So what we can do is we can then say, okay, how could we make it better? What are the investments that we could make in our natural and cap, uh, capital assets, which would yield greater benefits and therefore contribute to sustainable economic growth? So the way I like to think about this is to say, you've got your baseline. You know. There are loads and loads of people out there who've got many, many ideas about what to do about their local environment and more generally. If you asked uh, the great people in uh, BeBout, the Wildlife Trust, I have the privilege of being a vice president of, if you asked them, can you think of some things we could do to improve the uh, natural environment in our counties and make people's life better? You know, you could sit there for hours and listen to the ideas. There are fabulous ideas out there. So what you can do, and this is how to make it more scientific, is you take those enhancements and you draw them onto the baseline and see what the baseline would look like if you made those improvements. And then you can sort out which are the uh, no-brainers with great economic returns and those which may be less attractive. But all the time, not by looking at each one individually in an isolated way, but instead putting them into the system, into the natural capital systems as a whole, and then working out the benefits to the whole of the system, rather than the sort of cost-benefit analysis that um, uh, marginal economists might do. So this is not a simple application of um, 101 economics. This is thinking systematically, dare I say it, as a scientist would. And I like to think that the right unit to do that is catchments. So you should simulate these enhancement possibilities on a catchment by catchment basis. Why catchments? Well, we've got to have some disaggregation of the, the lands and England and Wales and Scotland are naturally driven out, driven out into their structures, into their maps by catchments. Some stuff will be left out, of course, but I like to have some roughly right categories that I can practically do stuff with rather than uh, um, try to uh, go for precision, which will never be achieved. And as I said in a minute, of course, carbon fits into this beautifully. Um, we need to think about enhancing the natural capital, uh, the natural capital, so that we can sequestrate more carbon. You know, one of the things I do in my net zero book is try to point out something which it seems to me is blatantly obvious, which is that you know the reason we have the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, and by the way, that's the only thing that matters: the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, which has been going up by two parts per million every single year since 1990, and is still going up. 
We've made no progress in the last 30 years. The reason we have that concentration is that we've unbalanced what nature has done for us for millions of years. You know, climate change in the form of the impact of the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is the balance of two things. It's the emissions we put up in the atmosphere, but it's also the ability of the natural environment to take them back out again. That's what climate change is about. And anyone who thinks you can get anywhere near net zero without addressing the carbon sequestration by the land and our land use is clearly living on a different planet and probably a very, very hot planet at that. So we can simulate on the landscape where you might plant trees, what sort of trees you might plant, what the net uh, of the aggregate natural capital benefits to the systems will be, and not just the carbon bit. We don't want a carbon silo. Um, tree planting is a classic example of silos. We had a, um, a forestry commission for a century whose job was to produce timber. And if you drive around the countryside, particularly in the uh, uplands, you can see the consequence of the dense green conifer forests and all the biodiversity consequences that flow to that and the consequence to water. The great thing about natural capital is it's a multiple set of assets, multiple uh, services flow from it. And by using the baseline and simulating enhancement, we can look at the opportunities to use the land to sequestrate more carbon and think where we can get the maximum total natural capital bucks for the scarce resource of money that we have available to spend. So that's how you do enhancements. And it'll apply to the soils, it'll apply to the trees, the vegetation cover, it'll apply to the rivers, and of course it applies to the atmosphere. And within this, the different combinations produce different benefits to us, mental and physical well-being, we're beginning to realize just how serious that is as an issue. Recreation, leisure, dealing with uh, outdoor, outdoor exercise, the beauty of the countryside, the wildlife, um, stopping paying for cleaning up the pollution that we subsidize to put on the land, uh, doing something about our air quality. All of these things form parts of the natural capital services which come from enhancing that baseline. So first of all, work out what you've got. Secondly, work out how to maintain it. And then thirdly, work out which enhancements are the best ones to go for, given our overall objectives of net zero, improving our biodiversity, improving the health and well-being of our population. That lot then lends itself naturally into national accounts and business accounts. And again, many environmentalists, their eyes glaze over when you start to talk about accountancy. Well, my, my view is get over it. You have to engage. This is what the economy is about. And let me explain just how radical doing natural capital accounting properly is for the country and for businesses through the accounts. So let me start with the national accounts. When our chancellor stands up and tells you that the deficit uh, this year is going to be larger than any deficit we've ever had on our budgets since uh, the worst years of the Second World War, he's telling you something which is deadly serious. As an aside, he's telling you that we want to consume a lot and make the next generation pay for it by giving them the debt which pays for our extra consumption today. That's why you should not think that the classic Keynesian demand side, borrowing by the state to enhance GDP growth by increasing consumption, is a free good international, intergenerationally. There are times when you should do it. Clearly now is one where we do need to support the economy. But remember, debt is something someone has to pay back. And we are leaving the younger people in our society in the next generation, a huge heap of that debt through what we're doing now. But now, let me tell you why that's a misrepresentation of where we are. And for two reasons. If we borrow to create new natural capital in assets, 
by paying for enhancements. Then there's a positive thing on the balance sheet. Our assets are better off. And there's a negative, which is the debt. If we borrow to simply spend, there's a deficit, the liability called the debt, and no assets. So asset-based accounting is something that isn't done. And without doing a proper balance sheet, we misrepresent to ourselves our general economic position. Now, if we have those assets on the balance sheets, assets and liabilities, and the ONS is building these accounts, and indeed greening the accounts, then the question comes, how do we account for capital maintenance? How do we account for filling in the potholes in the road, making sure those herring stock don't go too low? dealing with the consequences of our pollution? Well, the answer is that the capital maintenance should be a charge to the revenue account of government. What the Chancellor has left to spend should be after we've spent the money making sure that we've held our assets together. After all, that's what you have to do in your household accounts, and that's what any business has to do. If you don't fix the potholes, then the roads will get worse and eventually it'll cost you even more in the future. If you net it off from the budget before the Chancellor stood up, the cost of capital maintenance, maintaining our climate, maintaining our biodiversity, maintaining our rivers, maintaining our peat box, maintaining our soils, you would realise that the amount of money available left to spend is a lot less than it was before. And that's something that people don't want to admit, or at least politicians don't want to admit. Indeed, probably the public doesn't want to own up to. But it tells you a fundamental economic truth. We are currently living beyond our environmental means. We are consuming too much of our climate, and we're consuming too much of our biodiversity, and too much of our renewable natural capital assets. And there's no other way of putting it. And the truth is, if we go on doing that, then our economy will not be sustained. And that's a simple way of saying, you know, we'll fry when the, natural, when the climate gets hot enough. And when the biodiversity is low enough, we will reap the consequences. And good economics says that we can grow. Of course, economic growth can go on. Technical change is happening extremely rapidly. New ideas are coming along all the time. That's a source of economic growth. But first, we would have to rebase our consumption. So these conceptual issues, these accounting issues, have a radical counterpart to tell you what you really would have to do if you really wanted to enhance our natural environment and leave it in a better state for future generations. And for companies too, it's no good putting pollution in the atmosphere and not paying for it. You know, those damages should go back onto company balance sheets. They should take back the pollution they cause. Polluters should pay, but do bear in mind when one advocates that companies should do that. Companies only produce stuff for us. It all comes down to our consumption. The reason why many of the things we buy are the prices they are is because they don't include the pollution costs that are contained within them. If they contain the pollution costs, because companies were forced to uh, take responsibility for the pollution they cause, you'd pay more for your food in the supermarket. You'd pay more for all the things you buy. And so you should. Because, of course, you should pay the environmental costs of your consumption. That's what a sustainable economy is about. And there's no way out. There's no way of pretending you can just ignore that, except to bequeath the next generation the debt and the consequences of the pollution that overconsumption has caused. That's what a sustainable economy is. Now, let me turn to applications. I've said what the concepts are. I've said what the tools are, the baseline, the capital maintenance, the enhancements, and the accounts. Let me turn to some applications. There are three principles that I think one should usefully apply in trying to do this application. One is the polluter pays. The second one is public goods, uh, public money for public goods. And the third one is net environmental gain. They are three principles that would characterize an efficient economy. And therefore, in the long run, they are the concepts which make for the most sustainable level of economic consumption and growth that we can have. Now, the polluter pays principle is a very simple idea. It simply says 
that in any ac economic activity, farming, um, making electricity, building cars, making packaging, what you should do is you should reflect all the costs in the price. Okay? And if you don't, then you're imposing those costs on someone else and they'll end up a burden to someone else. So if you put um, nitrates on the land, nitrogen fertilizers, uh, which have been responsible for huge increases in, in farm output, and you let them flow into the ditches and into the river, and they pollute the river, you're not paying the costs, the full costs of growing your crops, but you are making sure that you and me as water customers will have to pay higher bills for our water because we'll have to clean up the damp, pay for cleaning up the damage by the water companies of what's been put on the land. And if we subsidize it to be put on the land as well, then you add those two things together, you can see the net of that is chronically inefficient. Now, the obvious place to start is carbon. And carbon's relatively easy to price. Why? Well, because it's a single uh, gas, in fact, greenhouse gases, a series of gases, they're pretty easy to measure, and it doesn't matter where you emit them anywhere in the world. And to put a price on carbon is a necessary condition to seriously address climate change. So um, we put a price on carbon. We put the same price on carbon on all carbon from wherever it's produced and by whoever it's produced. Same price in agriculture, same price in transport, same price in energy, and crucially, same price for imports as domestic production. Many of you have followed the debates about uh, what we should do about food imports. Uh, people say, you know, we shouldn't be importing cheap beef from cleared rainforest in uh, the Amazon. Dead right. We should make sure that when that stuff arrives at our border, that it pays for the carbon costs that are caused in the process of raising that beef, but so should our, our farmers too pay for the carbon costs of what they do. Remember, agriculture is 0.6% of the economy, less than 1%. It produces at least 11% of the emissions. It's the most polluting sector that our economy has in carbon terms, and that excludes the emissions from peat and only uh, imperfectly measures the emissions from soils. So we need to apply this price so that we find the cheapest way first of reducing carbon emissions and we make sure we do it across the whole economy. Now I would do that for um, pesticides, I would do that for a whole series of other pollutants because that's what an efficient economy should do. Of course you have to do it pragmatically, gradually, uh, in a step-by-step -step way, but there's an obvious path to go down it is an efficient economy. It's what economists should advocate we do. And it's very, very good for the environment. And it's actually good for all those non-polluting businesses in the economy. And it's bad for the polluting businesses. There's not more to like about that unless you're a polluter. Okay, so the second case is public goods for public money. And this is a, a, a now a, a stock phrase, which was quite novel two or three years ago. But um, in the... Um, uh, consequence of Brexit, uh, it was rapidly realized that we'd have to reinvent environmental policy and uh, agricultural policy and fisheries policy in this country. Uh, indeed, I often say to people that Brexit is largely about DEFRA and uh, 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 environmental and agricultural regulation. That's where most of it is. And we have outsourced uh, our regulation of those sectors to the EU for nearly 40 years. Uh, and we're now having to reinvent it. So the question comes, why would you pay three billion to farmers, um, two billion of which you pay for them to own land, when you could use that three billion, so leave farmers just as well off, the same amount of money in the farming sector, um, but pay them to do things which they wouldn't otherwise do and which benefit the wider society, the public goods. That's what public goods, public money for public goods is all about. And um, there are lots of people who say, oh, well, you can't do this because it'll make farmers go bankrupt. No, not at all. It'll switch the money from those people who have the opportunity to enhance our natural capital most. They're typically the upland farmers, the poorer farmers, the more marginal farmers, the smaller farmers, and take it away from the better off. 
Um, and yes, you have to adjust, address the border and make sure that the agricultural standards are there so trade is fair and not just free. But public goods for public money is an obvious principle. Public goods will not be produced by the private sector. Food isn't a public good, by the way. Uh, it's a private good. Uh, but um, uh, the opportunities of deploying that three billion in a more efficient way than we've done so far, they're great. And what's more, um, we can use these new digital technologies, we can use baselines, we can simulate the various options for public goods in our uh, farming uh, 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 lands, and we can work out which ones fit together best in the systems and which ones um, will accrue the greatest overall environmental and economic benefits. So what I described as the way of embedding the concepts applies directly across to the agricultural sector and to farm accounts, the accounts of every farmer. Uh, today, they don't include the soil, for example, their main asset. All of this needs to be sorted out. So farmers have a better basis to go forward. The subsidies remain in aggregate the same, but the subsidies deliver much better bucks for all of us. And when the day of reckoning comes from the deficits we've been running up this year, we're sure gonna need to make sure that we spend this money as efficiently as possible. And that brings me to the third and final application I wanted to illustrate this with, which is net gain. So there's a lot of furore about planning and build, 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 and um, whether or not the new uh, great build is going to be good or bad for the environment. And the idea has come up that anybody who wants to do a development and get planning permission must show net biodiversity gain. Now, that's uh, better than no gain at all. And it's net gain because, of course, we want to be risk averse and we can never be quite sure of the outcomes. But hang on a minute. If you take a site and compare it with another site and just look at the biodiversity, uh, um, impacts, you might miss a lot and you might end up doing perverse things. So what you want to know is whether the development will enhance or reduce the natural capitals as a whole and not just the biodiversity. Otherwise, you end up saying, well, we've got some newts on this site and if we take these newts and put them in a bucket and take them to some other site and stick them in another pond and add a few more newts, that will be net biodiversity gain. No, that's not enough. And just like we're in danger of using the carbon silo and just thinking about carbon gains, so we're in danger of thinking that biodiversity is the only component of natural capital and that we can think about natural capital in discrete little units of building development proposals. No, it's about systems. And it's about um, all the natural capitals, and it's about simulating these as enhancements against the baselines. So in each of these cases, there are obvious things we can do to honor our duty to be good stewards of our natural capital and to enhance our natural environment and thereby enhance our sustainable economic growth. Um, they're challenging, the toolbox is there, it's hard, conceptual, measurements apply and um, there is a huge set of consequential actions that flow and when you think about it in this way you realize that there really is an enormous prize out there for us you know, just think about what we could have imagine to use the title of my uh, description of this world we imagine a green and prosperous land imagine a world in which your kids can breathe in air, which is not gonna leave particles in their lungs. That we don't have to pay for all the health costs of the mental and physical uh, damage that's done by our pollution and our destruction of our natural world. What's not to like about that? What could be anything other than economically efficient about doing that? What's not like to like about cleaner rivers? about water companies that don't have to spend their time cleaning up the muck and pollution which is put in through the subsidies that we apply uh, to our land use. What's not to like about using natural capital to uh, protect us from floods rather than hard concrete and all the costs that go with that? 
You know, these are part of the price and they're all doable. We don't have to have sewage in our rivers. We don't have to have contaminated uh, beaches with um, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria now in our surf. We don't have to have this. We could be much better off. And the only way we're going to do that is to make the environment in the heart of our economy, take it seriously and really think it through and apply it. And we have the technologies now, digital technologies, the baselines, we have the opportunity to see exactly what we're doing and to make it a hell of a lot better. So that's what I try and set out. That's the opportunity. That's the positive vision of our future. And that all that stands in the way of doing this are all the vested interests and, dare I say it, our own very short-term selfishness because we are not taking the interests of future generations seriously. And I'd put it to you, it's our ethical duty to do that. And I'd also put it to you, it's economically efficient to do that too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deidre, for what you said was going to be a positive lecture, and it absolutely was.